Hey everybody, welcome to a special episode of the Disc Golf Answer Man. So I just want to do a real quick preface of this episode. We had team player Zach Newhouse. Uh, he was here in Emporia last week, and so I sat him down and thought, hey, let's have him answer a few questions. Now, I had messed – yes, guess what? I messed up the audio. Uh, it was a different setup, and I had the wrong mic turned up as we started our live broadcast on uh, YouTube. I got it fixed, and but uh, so this interview – slash answer questions is going to start out kind of weird. It's just all of a sudden you're going to hear us talking because it'll be at the point that I figured out that I had the wrong mic turned up. So before you roll your eyes and start laughing at me, this is why production studios have more than one person working on stuff because uh, you have one person dedicated to audio, one to camera, one, whereas in this point it was all me. So anyway, I figured it out and uh, let's get into this interview slash question answers uh, or disc golf answer make questions answered with Zach Newhouse. <laughs> Oh, I know what's going on. Here we go. I bet you can hear me now. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is why you guys you guys probably are laughing and you make fun, but this is why people have production studios where other people worry about stuff. So, yeah, it's what it is is that I'm used to when we record the disc golf answer man, yeah. I'm mic 1. So, <laughs> I had mic 1 ready to go. Now I uh uh now you should be able to hear me plenty fine now that I've got that turn up. Give me a signal on the YouTube channel. Let me know. Yep. All good now. There it is. Yay. Nice. All right. Yes. It, it works when you have the right microphone turned up. <laughs> okay. So we got to know you a little bit more and yep. now we can hear me. Um, tell us just real quick though, how you got your start going with, tell us kind of your disc golf story. Um. So I was a uh, college tennis player and one afternoon uh, a friend of mine said hey there's a course down the street you want to go play um, and I thought sure why not this sounds fun so we played casually for uh, probably two three years uh, met a couple people in kind of the local scene local club um, got into it a little bit I didn't really start playing tournaments until I'd moved to North Carolina a couple years later um, the disc golf scene in Charlotte, North Carolina, if you're not aware, is pretty substantial. Um, and so got into really competitive um, tournaments and, and league play and everything like that. Uh, living there, um, met some really great people, um, kind of advanced my game to the point where I turned pro, I believe, in 2008. Yeah. Um, and have just tried to evolve ever since. Excellent. Um, why I remember, I can't remember when I first met you. Obviously, you're already on the team. I we know that at GBO. Did we? Okay, that would make sense. We were sense. at Applebee's for dinner. Okay. I remember now. Yep. Yeah, we all had dinner and it at had Applebee's. Had been in like 2009. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. And then, of course, I remember meeting up. Uh, we went to the, uh, uh, what's it called? The uh, Outdoor Retailer Show. Yep. And uh, because you were there working for um, Timberland, Timberland, I was going to say Columbia Sportswear, but that's completely different. (laughs) And uh, so anyway, so uh, so I've known you quite a I've known you quite a few years, but I've only seen you on occasion and stuff like that. So so very cool. So we're going to do a player interview. If you've been listening to the Disc Golf Fans Man podcast. Um, you know that we've been lately we've been doing player interviews where we actually spotlight uh, individual team members per podcast. And we'll, we'll dive more into his disc golf career and stuff like that in that particular episode that we'll par- we're going to record uh, as soon as we're done here. We won't go live with that one. I don't know. Maybe we will. We'll see how this works out if I can get the mics to work fine. Um, but uh, we will we'll record that and you can listen to that later on down the road uh, to learn a, a, even more about uh, Zach Newhouse. But I thought we could just actually. D- dive right in and get some disc golf questions answered. Is Let's that cool do with it. You? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to pull up the Google Docs form and uh, where did I put that? Let's see. Here it is. All right. So this one is from Luke. Luke. <laughs> he put his name as Luke Daddy Hit Trees. <laughs> 
Oh, that's Man. fantastic. Very clever, Luke. Daddy hit trees. Uh, he says, first of all, hey, guys, love the show. He has two questions. What recommendations would you give for someone that wants to reinvent their disc golf club? My city has a club, but there's absolutely no communication with players and the DG club. Should I create a new club? What are your thoughts? Wow, that is a tough one. Um, I would say, yeah, if you can get, you know, your own little club going, see if you can get uh, some support from a couple other people and start running some just, you know, weekly stuff to try to get more people involved and, um, you know, try to grow it from there. And if you get to the point where you have enough people, then, um, you know, you can kind of sort of elevate back into, you know, what your club may have been in the past or um, even better. I mean, without knowing the, you know, the ins and outs of each club, it's hard to tell you, like, I'll just just forget them and mm -hmm. start something new. So, you know, it, I would definitely try to exhaust all you can to make the club that's already there uh, work for yeah. you. Have you ever worked? Have you ever, like, been really involved with clubs at all? Uh, been involved with them. Yeah. Um, like I said, like I in Charlotte, our club had probably, I don't know, 500 some people. Oh, my in gosh. It. Wow. That's um, so it's yeah, it's pretty wild. But. There's definitely, you get the little groups and pockets of people here and there that, you know, want to be part of the club, but at the same time want to do their own thing. So yeah. um, it all just depends on the size and kind of the support you have within your local community. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's see the next, uh, his second part of his question is, how would I get the ball rolling for getting a new course in my city area? How do I go about this? Do I approach my city? Uh, you definitely can. Yeah. Um, I'll give Eric McCabe's answer here and yeah. say <laughs> you can contact him at what's his course sales at dynamic sales at com. Yeah. Dot com. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, whether it's through your club or if you meet somebody or know somebody at the, the parks department or the city, um, definitely toss the idea out there and uh, you know, never know what kind of response you're going to get and you can kind of take it from there. Yeah. Sorry guys. I got something in my eye here. It's driving me nuts. Um, ow. Oh, okay. Hold on. <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing being live and having something in your contacts. Woo. Okay. So we're going to try to make it through with the, if you guys are wear contacts, you know, this is not very fun to have this happen. So I would say my opinion is yes, you have, yeah, you have to go th through the city, but um, don't be, don't, and we've said this before, don't be too put off if they laugh in your face. Yeah. Now, disc golf is getting a little more well-known. I bet you, uh, you know, five years ago, you might get a better response now than you did five years ago, just based on disc golf being a little more prevalent in, uh, you know, city parks and stuff like that. So, you know, but don't be discouraged if they just immediately turn you off because, or turn you away. Um, you just got to keep going at it. You got to find the right people to get in. I mean, there's times where, um, you know, here, even here in Emporia, um, when things uh, change as far as different organizations, as far as organization heads, we find out that someone even knows about disc golf or mm -hmm. they're all for disc golf. We're like, yeah, now that's the person we want to talk to. So you definitely need to get to know people in that area because sometimes it's not always uh, what you know, it's who you know. Let's see. Next one is from Mars. I would. Oh, no, we don't want to do that one because that's a weird request. Someone wanted to use one of our images and I'm not sure why they used it to oh, here. To, yeah. but, uh, Scott asked, as an engineer and disc golf enthusiast, I'm very interested in the process of designing discs. Is there any engineering that goes into mold design or is it more of an artistic trial and error process? Is there an engineer designer you work with to create the physical mold. Do you ever do any prototype like 3d printing to test out a design? Scott, I'm assuming you're probably fairly new to the dynamic disc West side disc latitude 64 world. Um, how it works with us is that uh, we have Thomas Ekstrom who lives in Sweden, who uh, works at the latitude 64 factory. Uh, latitude 64 started um, molding discs. I would say a little bit over 10 years ago. Um, they had, you know, been, disc golfers and they came together. There was four of them that thought, you know what? I, we can probably make discs too. We'd like mm -hmm. to try, our, uh, try to make discs in the disc golf world. And, uh, they learned how to do it 
And thankfully, Thomas had the knowledge uh, to be able to design. I'm not sure what specific no, uh, like background, educational yeah. background. I've never actually, if, if I've asked that, I don't remember his answer. Um, and so they design our disc. Now, when it came fast forward, all kinds of stuff. And when it came time to design discs for us, I know that uh, they we uh, talked and thought it would be a good idea. And uh, the way it works with us is we give them ideas with their knowledge that Thomas has of creating discs. In other words, we say, well, we've got this, this, that's a little stable. We want something that's a little more stable, that's got a lot more glide, that finishes a hard left. Um, and he draws it up, shows us what he can make, sends us prototypes. We throw it. We say, yes, it's good. No, it's not good and stuff like that. And so I don't I know or at least I haven't heard that they use 3D modeling. Um, yeah, I don't know if they do. No, I think right now they're at, they're they're. I hate to say seasoned enough, but they right. they have enough experience where they should they can be able to just pump out some prototypes, you know, some uh, you know, ten to twenty of them, and then that way we can all test them and stuff like that. Um, I wish I could give you more. I'm sure you being an engineer, you're probably wanting more of the engineer answer. I just don't have that for you. Uh, and what we've we've interviewed Thomas. At least twice on the show. So if you can go to discgolfanswerman.com and find Thomas Ekstrom interviews, I bet you'll find out probably more of an engineer answer that you're looking for. Next one is from Kelvin. First off, great show. Keep up the good work. With you guys being big, big fans of The Office. Are you fans of The Office? Oh, yeah, you bet. Okay, being big fans of The Office and Star Wars, has Didi looked in doing a line of The Office or Star Wars like how there are Marvel, Marvel comic discs? First, let's see what... Who's your favorite character, Zach, in The Office? Oh, man. There's so many good ones. Um, I kind of like Andy. I'm a fan of Andy. Really? Yeah, Andy Bernard. He cracks me up. I don't know what the it Nardog? is about him. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That, that's a, I mean, I didn't know what to expect, but that's surprising. Yeah. I mean, there's the obvious, you know. Maybe that's what it is. The main yeah, characters they're, they're, are so yeah. obvious that I feel like of the rest, I really kind of. Andy. He, yeah. he can be funny. I'm at the trend, the part where uh, Michael is gone and now uh, Andy oh. is now the, the general manager. Yeah. So his they show a lot more of his antics and yeah. stuff like that. So, yeah. um, let's see. Who's your favorite Star Wars character? Oof. I don't know. That's a tough one. Um, I think you just got to like and appreciate the Luke story. Luke Skywalker? Yeah. That's fine. Who would you put on a disc? That's one part of his question. A disc? Oh, from the office. Would from you put office? Andy? Yeah, would oh, you? man. No, I'd probably put, for the humor factor, I would put when Gabe dressed up as Lady Gaga <laughs> for their, <laughs> That's good. their, their uh, Halloween. That's good. I'd probably, I'd want to put, uh... The episode where Andy gets a tattoo from his coworkers, <laughs> yeah, the little Nard dog, yeah, I'd put that on and see how many people would understand the reference. Yes, that's a good one. I could die. In fact, I could die Max Zach, see if people get the reference. Yeah, um, he did ask. So part of his question is, uh, how come we don't, or have we ever thought about? So real quick, Mar the way we can do Marvel is we are the official. We can officially do it because we purchase the license to be able to put Marvel on our discs. Um, I, I know that, uh, what is it? Disney is kind of the big parent company of all that, but having star Wars is a completely separate license. Yeah. So just because we bought in, as a matter of fact, with an interesting uh, tidbit is that even though we've bought the licensings for Marvel, it doesn't mean that we can do every Marvel hero under the sun. We, mm -hmm. we still, there's still certain entities uh, such as like Deadpool and stuff like that, that you have to pay separate licensing. Right. I thought that was crazy, but, yeah. it, but it makes sense. So Star Wars is on that. It's like a whole nother license, a whole nother price tag, not a cheap one. I might mind <laughs> you a whole nother price tag. And so that would fall along the same lines of the office as I would imagine there would be some licensing and that stuff like that so, to yeah. officially do the office. Now, of course you see people doing stuff, you know, from Star Wars and all kinds of different places. Um, but you'll never find anybody that's like from a company business official type stuff. Right. You might here and there, but it's not official. It's not, or at least it's, uh, well, copyright infringement yeah. is basically yeah. what it is. Anyway, next one is from Kevin. Greetings and salutations, Disc Golf Man. How are flight numbers picked? Do sponsored players go and throw prototypes and give feedback? Um, this one's kind of along the lines of the other guy. He wants to know how discs are initially designed. 
Well, we already talked about how they're designed. Yeah. But as far as flight numbers are picked, that's as much as it ticks off people. That's kind of, yes, what it is. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. We get prototypes every time a new disc comes out yeah. and they, you know, we get the sort of couple weeks later. Hey, what do you guys think? Is this kind of what you expected? And then I, you know, whoever here or back at Latitude kind of comes up with what the the numbers that attribute to the feedback right. is. Now, by this time, there's enough experience to kind of, you know, like we're not going to have someone say that should be a speed nine and someone else go, no, it's a speed 15. No, you're probably yeah. you're going to get like variances of one, maybe two speeds. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, I've heard people, you know, where I've heard talk where certain discs should be a glide five. And then we hear back from somebody else is like, it's more like a glide four. Yeah. Um, now we can get into the whole debate and whole argument of <laughs> flight numbers and what they mean, what they don't mean, why they should, somebody should invent a machine. You know, there's all, we can go down a huge rabbit hole on that, but yes, basically people are throwing them, giving feedback and that helps us determine what the flight number should be. What are your thoughts on flight numbers, Zach? Do you, when you go shopping for a new disc, do you immediately go look at the flight numbers? Uh, I, I take notice of them just to have kind of a, a benchmark of what it might do. Yeah. Um, and then just throw and kind of get your, your personal preference or take on it. I think the getting to deal with the whole prototype part of it kind of helps where there aren't really any numbers yet totally defined. It's kind of a, Hey, this is going to be an overstable driver. You know, what do you think? And then kind of go from there and, um, I mean, they're, they all seem to be fairly close, but obviously for different people, discs fly different, different things. Yep. So. All right. Next one is from Alex. Hey guys, love the show. Shout out to Robert. Oh, I wish Robert was here. Shout out, but we don't, we don't really like Robert that much anyway. So it's okay. He's not, yeah, he's okay. Shout out to Robert Birdman McCall. You the bomb bro. My question is this. Can you explain which discs you choose when it's really windy? Also, can you tell what disc you would choose in your current bag based on a headwind tailwind left to right, right to whoa? Okay, so we'll break it. We'll use okay. you. We'll use you. So first okay. of all, uh, can you explain which disc you choose when it's really windy? So let's say it is a headwind, just a full on, yeah, pretty good headwind. What disc are you grabbing? Uh, I will usually, depending on the distance, go for Defender, Enforcer, Felon, Criminal, something really overstable. Why is that? Um, into a headwind, you need the stability um, to kind of fight through it and then still have uh, a tail to it, a finish to it. Anything less stable, the wind's going to affect it a lot more, turn it over usually into the ground or in a direction you probably don't want it to go. All right, now let's go to the next one. Tailwind, what are you grabbing? Tailwind, then you, it's kind of the opposite. Then you go a little less stable. Um, so right now I've been trying out the new Captain um, as a mm. distance driver, it's fairly understable, but with the tailwind, it kind of gives you the extra stability um, and has a ton of glide. So that's yeah. nice. Um, truths in a tailwind, um, they already glide a bunch. Um, and so having the extra wind um, to keep it, keep it going um, is nice. You can always usually disc down, I guess, with the tailwind. Um, in a sense, because the wind is going to give you the push as well as create some extra stability. Um, so that's what I would normally go with. All right. Now he wants to know about a left to right. Why? Uh, yeah. Left to right wind. Uh, so th this always depends on what shape of the shot you actually want the outcome to be. Yeah. Um, with like a left to right wind as a backhand in a backhand throw, it's going to essentially knock down a hyzer. So I would still probably throw something overstable, but know that it's not actually going to finish to the left as much because the wind is going to start to knock it down uh, when it hits the top of the flight plate. Whereas if I throw quite a few forehands in a left to right wind, it's going to get picked up and carried with the wind. Um, so I usually try to avoid it. I try to make sure that, especially in crosswinds, that the wind is always hitting the top of my disc. So I'll throw whatever angle essentially against the wind to okay. fight it. So I guess that would be the same with right to left. You just kind of do the then opposite. Just the opposite, yeah. yeah. Just the opposite of what you said. Yeah, yeah cuz he says uh what's uh just so I know, just so I can know what at what stability based on my skill level that I need to throw. I seem to have trouble picking the right disc when wind is coming left to right or right to left. Oh. 
So yeah, that, I mean, it, kind of, yeah. especially like if you're going to throw like a left to right wind as a righty backhand, if you throw it Anheuser, the wind is going to want to push it. So if you were to throw something really overstable, it's just going to keep going right, 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 right until it says it doesn't want to go right anymore. Yeah. But if you do take something overstable, it will try to fight back out of that. But it's definitely a lot tougher to control in the crosswind, letting the wind push the disc as opposed to pushing against it. Gotcha. And actually I have how, how, uh, how cool is that? I actually have some captains because you mentioned you're trying out the captain yep. for the tailwind. What, what is it about the captain again that you're, you're really digging? Uh, just with the tailwind, because it's understable, it's really fast and has a ton of glide. Um, it's, it's really new. I generally have been throwing trespasses in tailwinds. Mm -hmm. So the captain's a little bit faster. Yeah. Seeing if I can get a little bit extra distance out of it. That's what I've been doing at, when we've been going out for casual. Now I've only maybe done it two, three times. I had a couple captains with me. And, uh, when I would throw a shot with the trespass, I would grab my captain to, just mm -hmm. to see what happens. And they seem to have very similar flights, but the captain seems to give me another 20, 25, maybe 30 feet yep. on the throw. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so I'm really, really digging the captain. Now, would you sidearm the captain at all? Uh, the tailwind? Yeah. Tailwind? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything less than that would be tough because it is fairly understable to, gotcha. to put that much yeah. speed and spin on it with a forehand. Yeah. So if you're watching now, remember when we've mentioned this before, uh, recently, um, the, tomorrow, Friday, April 13th, <gasps> oh, I just realized no. tomorrow is Friday the 13th. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, the captain comes out in the stock stamp, um, as well as the Maverick comes out. Now, have you thrown the Maverick? Is that in your bag at all? Uh, I've only thrown it a couple times. Really? Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, I'm I'm not sure yet. Um, really? It, because of the, it's got a really small rim for a fairway driver. Yeah. Um, which I don't know how much I like or dislike that. Oh, wow. I've been throwing the Thief okay. as my kind of understable fairway driver, and it's a yeah. little bit sharper um, of a nose. Yeah. And that for me seems to fit my hand a little bit better, but um, I'll definitely kind of continue to give the Maverick a try and see. I like the Maverick. I'm I'm curious. I'm, I might pick up because again, this is this comes out tomorrow as well in the stock stamp. Um, of course, we've had the first run in the Captain and the Maverick uh, a couple of weeks ago come out, um, but I want to get a couple loose because I have a a special edition Maverick mm -hmm. which I like. And then uh, I was able to get my hands on a match play, okay. which is just a fusion burst. And that thing, oh, it throws so good for me. Last night I posted on Facebook. I saw um, that. Yeah, there was hole 15, Jones East. Three, I actually, I actually <laughs> I know I know. you did. <laughs> I even looked at it before and I thought, that was not 450. And I looked it yeah. up and I, three, I was like, 351. And then I saw another spelling error and took care of that and forgot to change the 451. <laughs> so anyway, I threw three, it was a 351 foot hole and I threw it so nice and clean. And there's a tree on the left that you have to kind of either go super straight. A lot of people sidearm it to go yep. out over the road that's there and bring it in. Or some people do a little turnover. I did a really straight shot. It turned just a little bit, but came back just enough and parked right under the basket. Even went past a little bit more. And uh, Jeremy was there and some other people were there. They were cheering me on. And I looked at it. I was like, that is the best throw I've ever done on that <laughs> basket. And then a lot of times when I threw the Maverick, I would people would be like, that's a nice throw throw mm -hmm. so and what's good is jeremy was throwing the maverick as well and uh, so it's just a really good disc for all skill of us so i you know i you know obviously we you can't have every mold right. in your bag yeah but i would definitely give it a try because a lot of people are really enjoying the maverick so anyway tomorrow 11 a.m central the loose are uh, the lucid stock stamp captain and the lucid stock stamp maverick all right that's enough commercial time <laughs> back to the real stuff <laughs> kidding we got to throw that in every now and then um so this one is from rec rob mr robert hastings who um hopefully you enjoyed some of the instructional videos that he posts on disc golf answer man because he's doing a good job with those he says hello disc golf answer man the other robert here working very hard on uh putting as we know at the end of the day putting is the key to going from a good player to a great player my question is when i'm putting i have a hard time letting the disc go anywhere outside the chains makes me want to just jam the putt every time what tips can you give to just let your let yourself let it go so to speak and trust it will find its way back to the chains Wow. Um, 
I'm trying to piece together the outside the chains putting. I'm assuming you mean from longer distances. Yeah. Um, for me, I generally try to stay essentially within the chains until probably about 50 or 60 feet. And then um, when you do have to kind of add a little bit more height or, you know, hyzer to get it to travel that extra distance, um, I try to like visualize a point about halfway between myself and the basket of sort of where I want that disc to go. So you just kind of pick a line and find that spot and then just essentially aim at that spot and throw your same normal putt and not worry about essentially the basket, but hitting a point in the air or out in the distance and let the disc kind of naturally then fade back into the basket. Gotcha. Good stuff. I'm trying to find a few questions. A lot of these, some of these questions are directed specifically at Eric. So I want to be fair to these guys so they can. Uh, Absolutely. Let's see if you've got, if you got a question on YouTube, let us know if you have any questions. Let's see. Some people comment, need some Marvel villains too. What's up, Jarrett? Um, how much will they be at Sports Academy? I guess we Academy have some Academy Sports for Acad- Marvel stuff. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure what the pricing is over there. I can't imagine it's not going to be too far off what we have prices here. No, I'd assume it'd be what the regular price is here. Let's see. Let's see if we can find another one. Oop, that's part two of that question. Oh, this is good. Johnny, this is this. A lot of people are asking this on Facebook. Uh, Johnny from St. Louis says, will the Lucid S- X plastic be a limited run if put into production? Or will this be a long term choice forever and trying to decide how many trespasses to buy if they're released? So it sounds like a collector dude here. Um, yeah, a lot of people have been asking because we have the new Lucid X, which is a uh, special blend plastic that we've put for the touring uh, team. Uh, a lot of team members that are out there touring to kind of help raise funds for them. Uh, we have the Lucid X Trespass for Eric McCabe, the Lucid X Enforcer for Zach Melton, the Lucid X Felon for Eric Oakley, and then the Lucid X Convict for Paige Pierce. Um, some of those molds sold out really fast. Um, so it's going to be a few months before we get more made and more sent here. Whether that's going to be a regular plastic that you'll see more often I honestly don't know. And I don't know that. I mean, it depends on how popular it is, I guess. Yeah. And then how to make sure we can make, make sure we can make more of it, I guess. Is, I know that's a kind of a silly way yeah. to say it, but you know, we got to make sure that uh, we have the capacity to make more and more. I, I would imagine that the, without knowing the specific plans is to, we will want to continue with the tour fundraising. Yeah, Absolutely initiative and so we're probably going to keep it to where it's just tour fundraising discs now whether you're going to see that in like a lucid x suspect or lucid x you know uh uh emac truth i don't know i don't know if it's going to extend out that way um i'm sure uh if the possibility is there and it makes sense uh, for raising funds for those uh team guys that it'll happen but no i don't know for certain um, I know you, they did just post a sneak peek of a VIP X worship oh, yesterday really? on, I think it was on Instagram. Okay. Um, so they're definitely using that plastic for other things or testing it out right. to see what other um, molds they might be able to use it on. So I'd definitely look to see for more of that in the future in some way, shape or form. All right. Let's see if we can find another question. See if anything come across YouTube. The Reels says, do you hold the disc on the side farthest from you or on the side you're pulling toward? Side farthest from you? Do you hold the disc on the side farthest from you or the side you are pulling toward? I would – I'm going with the side you're pulling toward is my – interpretation of this question i mean because your hand would be here you're sort of pulling yeah. that way you can't really i don't know get your hand around the back side of it yeah not I'm, really i mean i've it's like what do you <laughs> so like if you want to throw away from you would be like this side yeah okay this oh 
Yeah. So it would be okay. I guess, so, away so, from your body. So, so Anthony's explaining. Yeah. He's thinking mm-hmm. he meant. Do you throw like this or do you throw like this? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you put the disc? Is yeah. Your away from your body or like towards the basket? The reel says from your chest. Yeah. Okay. So like okay. Yes. So yeah, your my hand, your hand with throwing would essentially be opposite of your chest. Right. And then as you let go, obviously you're opening up towards the towards the target away from you. Yeah. But ultimately, I guess yeah, when you're holding the disc in your hand, maybe not exactly opposite of your chest, but I don't know if you look at it on a clock, like I don't know, one o'clock or so, um, holding the disc out in front of you so that your hand is at least. On the do other. you get do you get pretty close to your chest with the disc? Uh, fairly close. Yeah, yeah. Same. And do you when you really do you uh, like you know like Eric likes to release on a little bit of a hyzer? Yeah, because he the you know whatever he picks he's 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 counting on mostly kind of a flip up. Yes. Is that you or do you? I'm fairly similar. Yeah, oh, okay. I prefer flat to hyzer versus anhyzer. Yeah, yeah. I try to throw as straight as possible. Cause I don't, well, the way I release the disc, I, if I'm not paying attention or if I screw up, yeah. I, I tend to do nose up and let go like this Yes, and I get so mad. Yeah. And I that's screw easy up. to do. And because I don't have the power to make, if I, right. you know, if I mess up a little bit or something, it's not going to flip up. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, maybe I, I mean, someone would say maybe I have the wrong discs, but then I'm afraid if I get too, cause if I, like I uh, used to throw a hatchet a lot and I put it back in my bag just to throw it around a little mm-hmm. bit. And I, I turned it over too much and too much to the point where it's like, maybe it's just not my disc anymore. And yeah. you know, um, so anyway, I mean, I think ultimately if you can throw flat consistently, that's the best way to go. Yeah. Um, I'm just probably <laughs> now last more, night more I, confident with a little bit of hyzer on a disc than. I had a shot where I had to throw between two trees and I usually throw my suspect, but when I throw my suspect, I throw a little bit outside knowing it's going to come in. It's mm-hmm. going to finish hard left, but there was a tree in the way. So that wasn't, you know, that wasn't going right. to work, but I was, I grabbed my deputy and it was the deputy actually that I putt with. And I know that Eric says, don't throw your putting putter, yeah. but it was the only deputy I had on me because I didn't plan my bag very well. And you hit a tree. Um, no, oh, I, good. I threw it and I purposely told myself, release it like this. Yeah. And that thing just stood up so pretty. Perfect. And it, it stood up and got out of the way of the one tree and then came back and missed the other tree. And I actually, people actually clapped for me on that You're side. So it good, was a good Bobby. shot. Yeah, right. That was just one good shot I had. But, I mean, it's just interesting how for a shot, when you're shaping the shot, how you got to pick the right disc. Because I knew that – I knew if I threw it – in the past when I threw that deputy straight, mm-hmm. it would turn a little too much. Yeah. If I had to get on it a little bit. So I knew if I released it like this, it would stand up. But it's just interesting how you have to, mm-hmm. how you can manipulate the way you release it to manipulate the the shape. Yeah. Shape, whatever. Uh, Zach, what are your personal disc golf goals for 2018 season? To hopefully play as many as possible um, with a full-time job and living where I do. Um, tournaments are fewer and harder to come by than uh, I may ultimately like, but I think ultimately um, my goals are to have fun, do as well as I can at the couple of tournaments that I do get to play. Um, For me, the GBO and Canadian Nationals are kind of the two major events that I usually play. Um, I was fortunate to have a good finish last year here at the GBO. So I yeah, finished seventh. Yep. So I hope I can. You're on the lead card for. I was. Was it round two round or two, three? Yeah. Round two. Round two. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Um, so I'd like to, you know, hopefully have good finishes here and uh, as well as at Canadian Nationals this year. You play. So you play. Okay. Say so last year you, you played the Emporia Country Club course once, right? No, we didn't. You that played was twice? the round that got canceled. Never mind. You didn't Final play it at all. Final round got canceled. We played Olpe. But you played the, the uh, Emporia I course. I played it. Two years ago, it was the final round of GBO for us. What are your thoughts on, because we played it this morning because yep. we did some course preview stuff. In fact, if you've been waiting for that, I filmed Eric and uh, Zach early this morning on that. What were your thoughts on some of the changes? That I really like the changes. Yeah, um, I think the flow of the course is really good. Um, and the, you know, there weren't any significant changes, but the little kind of, changes that 
did happen, I think we're all in a positive positive way. So, so what are your thoughts? Okay. So, so it's tournament day, right? Mm -hmm. And you walk up and hole number one is 1,135 feet. Uh, (laughs) what what goes through your mind? I mean, you're getting all amped up, ready to play. And now you've got to like, you've got to have to have two killer drives. Yeah. I, I think that first hole, especially being a long one, um, is just Advance it as far down the fairway as you can, and then um, if you make do a birdie, it one more time, if you make yeah, do it one more time, maybe two more times. <laughs> yeah, um, if you make a birdie, great. But you know, ultimately, a long hole like that, especially at the start of a round, to just avoid uh, kind of disaster. Yeah, um, if you can avoid taking bogey or or worse. Uh, I feel like that's a positive start to the day. So I'm anxious to see uh, the pros come out and play. So uh, real quick, get your opinion. Mm-hmm. And uh, don't worry about any backlash. But what is your <laughs> <laughs> because as soon as we're done, you have Thanks, to Bobby. you have to see that you're probably going to go hang out with the person that I'm <laughs> that okay. most dealt with this. Um, there's a lot of chatter on Facebook and stuff like that. Pros and cons, people for and against. Oh, yeah. The pros only playing one course. Yeah. Give us your real thoughts on that, Zach. My real thoughts are I understand why and appreciate why we're doing it, obviously, for the viewership and spectators and um, the touring pros that, you know, that this is their job and they want to have time to practice and play their one course and get it dialed in for them to have the best finish. Ultimately, for myself, uh, I prefer kind of the variety um, of playing multiple courses, um, and that's just a, a personal preference. And and for me, um, not having disc golf as my primary source of income, um, I enjoy the challenge of playing multiple courses, different holes. Um, but at the same time, when you play the one one course over and over, you do have the yes um, chance to better yourself, right? To you get, know, the second get time or, back on a yeah, hole or something. Exactly. So um, uh, both ways are fine. Ultimately, for me, if it was my personal decision, I would like to play multiple courses. But at the end of the day, we're all playing disc golf. Yep. Uh, let's see. Someone from YouTube says, what would be a step up from the sheriff? I can do well with it with little wind, but turn it over too much in a headwind. Uh, the step up from the sheriff would likely be the defender. Okay. Um, it's going to be similar speed and glide with just a little bit extra stability to it. Gotcha. There you go, Michael. Um, uh, back to the uh, Google form. Hey, answer crew. Uh, this is from Tyler. M- recently, my club, local club was wrapped up. Wish, let me start this over again. <laughs> recently, my local club has wrapped up our winter PDJ league. The TD told me that even during a PDGA league, if the park allows alcohol, that it is fine to drink during the league. I was talking to another friend of mine about this, and he is sure that this is not the case. And now I'm seeking help from the professionals. Um, Yes, Tyler, if it's a PDGA sanctioned event, if it's sanctioned by the PDGA, then you are not allowed to drink alcohol during the round. Correct. Yes. So I'm not sure where the information your your first friend got, but your second friend is right. Um, so there it is. Absolutely. And uh, you can quote us on that to your first friend. Does DD make Mark asked? Does DD make a soft or flexible deputy similar to a soft pure? Where you are in luck because this question came back in February twelfth, but as recently as a couple weeks ago, I believe it was, we came out with the classic soft. Deputy, um, and I fact I actually picked one up because I I've heard different people say they really like the soft mm-hmm. feel to the plastic, so I picked one up. I putted. We had tags last night, and I putted with with it a couple times. You definitely have to get used to the feel. Now, do mm-hmm. you what what plastic type do you putt with? Uh, I putt with either the classic hard or the blend. The blend, okay. Yeah. Which in the summertime, when it gets warm, it gets, it gets a little soft, softer. Yeah. Now that's usually when I make the switch. I was looking for pictures to put on the YouTube, and I noticed a couple pictures where you're putting. You mm-hmm. putt? Do you still putt with the Cenus? Uh no. Okay, so you that used was to, I believe for that was quite a while. Photography, 
purposes. Oh, that was for, okay. As in, those well, were no, the discs one available at the time that I. Okay, no, okay. There was one picture. Maybe you weren't putting, but you, you were. It was with the. It was raining. Okay. Were you? You weren't here at Worlds, right? Not Worlds, no. Okay, so it would have been GBO two years ago. You had a it coat, was awful. yeah, and it was awful. Yeah, and you had a Cenus, and you were kind yeah. of wiping it off. But it may have been that, an upshot. Uh, that tournament, I think I had putted with the Cenus a because couple of times. The- because it was wet yeah. and cold and windy. I've heard people... So I definitely, at times, yeah. used it. I've heard of people using using a Cenus or even a Suspect as their putter yep. uh, if it's really, really windy to take advantage of that uh, overstable. Yep. So what do you putt with? Uh, I putt with Wardens. Wardens, okay. Yep. If Robert was here, he would cheer yep. you on. I have been trying Marshalls, and I've been going back and forth. So Now, I'm, okay, so that's interesting. So yep. why? Why try something yeah. different? Uh, I mean... For me, a lot of it's just the feel. Like, unless it's really, really understable or really, really overstable, inside of 40 feet, the flight is almost the same. Um, So for me, it just comes down down to how it feels in my hand and essentially the release and how it comes out. Um, Some days I'll I'll carry both just, just in case. If one doesn't feel right, I can switch to the other and ultimately get the same results, but just have kind of that different uh different feel in the hand gotcha so anyway back to the original question yes we do have some soft deputies that are available right there's some now. pretty sweet burst ones in yeah there. um let's see this one's from justin i can throw 600 feet backhand but my forehand is terrible 600 feet Woo. okay okay so now last time last time we kind of had a little something when someone said how far they threw someone wrote in and said, Hey, he really can do it. So maybe he can. Yeah. So, if he can, that's, hey, I, that's awesome. Am, that's, that's like, yeah, that's amazing. I can't say I've ever hit the 600 foot mark. Yeah. How far have you, have you thrown? Uh, the farthest I know recorded was in the USDGC distance competition. It was 512. Dang. That's pretty good. Um, so Justin says, after working on it for a year, I've decided to try throwing left-handed. Why? If you, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to start, uh, uh, with mid ranges and do field work, but am I supposed to fan grip or power grip mid ranges? I never power grip mids or ferry drivers with my right hand. Should throwing left-handed be any different? My turnover shots are decent, but playing in Oklahoma wind requires a solid forehand lefty hand, or a solid forehand slash lefty back end. Man, if you can learn to throw left-handed, more power to you. Because if you can throw righty and lefty, that would be fantastic. I, I'm sure it will not be the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, but if you just can't seem to throw forehands well, and um, and you feel that you need that that type of a shot, I'd say go for it and and learn to see if you can learn to throw left-handed. Um, Oh, and what was his, what was the other um, what was the other part of his question? Uh, I never power oh, grip the power f- grips and fan grips. Yeah. Um, I again to me that's all a personal preference thing. I actually fan grip everything. I use the same grip on putters, drivers, everything, and I even use a fan grip because I prefer the kind of the control out of it versus the power grip. Um, so I'll sacrifice the little bit of distance that I might get from a power grip. Um, and use a fan grip. So whether you do that right-handed versus left-handed, I think is ultimately just going to come down to how it feels um, feels in your hand to you. Gotcha. All right, I'm going to jump over to the Disc Golf Answer Man Facebook page, and I just shared it to the group. So hello to those who have joined us from the group. George wants to know, uh, what is Zach's favorite course in the Charlotte area? Oh, man, Renaissance Gold. Really, why? Hands down, because it is brutally tough, but... Such an awesome challenge and such a good variety um, to it. It was probably the first true kind of championship level course that I ever played. And it kicked my butt and it was awesome. (laughs) That's cool. So this morning when we were filming, um, I noticed a lot of times, not a lot of times, but uh, quite a few times when Eric, now we know Eric's not known for his forehand, but he's been practicing and he's getting good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you would step up and you would, you're, you're going for that forehand shot. What, yeah. what's a deciding factor for you on a hole that could go either way as far as what you really need to throw? A lot of it comes down to wind. Okay. Obviously what direction the wind is going. And then 
sort of which side of the fairway I want to stay away from. So if there's OB on one side or the other, um, I'll generally try to always throw away from it. So if the OB's on the right, I'll throw a right-handed backhand so that I'm fading away from out of bounds. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously the opposite the other way. Um, And sometimes it also comes down to just picking the most open space there are a couple of holes today where there's a few trees in front that you can kind of pick one side or the other. And I always try to find the most airspace to throw through um, just so that if you are a little bit offline, chances of at least hitting the intended fairway is a more likely chance. Yeah. I know, I know one shot. Um, sorry, Eric, but one shot, <laughs> one shot you guys threw, you threw it forehand and it went really well. I can't remember what hole it was. And Eric threw it and it hit a tree and he was going for a much tighter gap than you. And yep. you actually made mention. That's why I always throw toward the bigger gap. Yep. So, um, I mean, it, it's one of those things that, Oh, okay. That yes, mm-hmm. no, or duh. But then it's just something that, you know, maybe some people don't think about. It's always, mm-hmm. can you throw through the bigger gap Yep. and stuff? Um, so we'll just get this one out of the way from Vash. Pancakes or beige, Belgian waffle? I'm sure he wants to know from the... Anyway, important question. Which one? Uh, pancakes. Really? Yeah. Why? Just uh, growing up, that was... My dad would make chocolate chip pancakes on Ooh. Saturday mornings. And it's a uh, nostalgia. I'm going with nostalgia. I My mother used to make pancakes and she used to make... Uh, Put bananas in them. Oh, that's always that was good. so good. And then you put a little, just a little bit of peanut butter on there. Mm. Man, that's good. I do like waffles. Typically, when me and my wife, and it's a Saturday morning, we're like, don't want to fix breakfast, and we want to just mm-hmm. kind of splurge a little bit, and we go to IHOP. Yeah. Actually, we don't go. We order in it, and I have to go pick it up. <laughs> Love you, babe. Um, it's, <laughs> it's that... Uh, I get the pancakes. She gets the waffles. She really okay. likes waffles over pancakes. Um, there is something about a, the waffle flavor that mm-hmm. I like. Have you ever had the the famous chicken and waffle? Oh, yeah. Growing up, like the 10 years I lived in North Carolina in the South, yeah. chicken and waffles is is a thing, and it's legit. There's one in Arizona that we've gone to the last three years, I think it is, and it's I think it's called Lolo's, Lulu's, Lulu's or Lolo's. Okay. Chicken and waffles, so good. What about Torchy's Taco? <laughs> now I'm on the Never side. been there, man. I've never been to you Torchy's never, Tacos. Oh, my God. You need to go to know, uh, te- a Texas tournament so yeah. we all can go to Torchy's. They, of course, I'm sure our listeners know, but there is called the, uh, what is it called? The Rasco? The Rosco. Rusco. Rosco. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Anthony. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, what? What? Um, so anyway, yeah, it's a, chi- it's a chicken and waffle taco. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It yeah. Anyway, we I'd won't be go all down over there. it. Um, let's see. Anybody at YouTube got questions again? Uh, like the swing of that test. Okay, people are just looks like there's just people are chattering. Uh, Chenzo, are AM players allowed to be sponsored by local bars, bowling alleys? I was recently at a local bowling alley slash bar discussing with the owner the sport of disc golf and my plans to compete in tournaments this year. The discussion turned into a potential sponsorship opportunity for me, for me where I would be provided polos advertising the establishment with the ex- expectation of wearing them during tournament rounds and they cover the cost of my entry fees. Is this allowed in any capacity? First of all, Chenzo, Good on you for taking mm-hmm. that ini- initiative. That's pretty cool. Now, what is your f- feedback on that? I feel like there's no reason that yep. you wouldn't be able to do that. No. I mean, there are people that are sponsored by I don't know, local small disc golf shops. Uh, you know, Paige and Ricky and whoever else are sponsored by a drink, kombucha. Um yeah, I don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah, there's nothing uh, currently in place that would prevent you. Uh, it would not ruin anything as far as your PDJ standings, rating, membership, mm-hmm. um, ability to move up to pro, not move up to, and, you know, none of that. Yeah. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. So if you are able to secure a sponsorship from a local uh, bar or whatnot, I would definitely go for it and then do your best to represent them. Um All right, we'll skip that one. All right, Josh wants to know, hi, how do you, how do you, 
organize your bag. Josh, currently I have a Prodigy BP-1. Since I just started, I wanted an affordable bag that would hold me over until I, ste- I step up. The downside of this great little bag is that it doesn't hold a ton of discs, so organization mm-hmm. is the key. I currently fit three putters in the putter pocket and reserve the main compartment for mids and drivers, but what's the best way to organize them? What has proven to work for you? So how do you organize your bag? Oh, man. I, don't, I feel like I just... I guess I put them all in the main compartment. I don't really. Yeah, but do you I, do anything like like mids and drivers? Or I generally do. Yeah, like sl- slowest to fastest. I guess. With, okay. You know, with yeah, I guess putters and mids on sort of one side and drivers on the other side. Yeah. Um, but within that, is there is there anything organized uh, as far as like your drivers? Is there any? I guess method to what's where they're at generally in stability probably mm-hmm. would be like, but at, okay. So you're saying like you have your drivers and you would actually literally go from stable to overstable. Yeah. Or more stable? Yeah. So I'll put oh, like okay. a trust pass, then an enforcer, then a defender, something like that. Do you where, keep that? Like if you're yeah. in a tournament, does it stay that way as you're putting them back in or relatively close? Okay, I'm yeah. Not, yeah. I don't go over the top and make sure that every disc goes exactly in the exact same spot it right. came out of. But now do you use the, cause you use the Ranger bag. You yeah. have one of the, uh, what's it? I know it's a gray and black one. I can't remember the name of it, Yeah. but do you keep any discs on the top? Generally I don't. You got enough in the main compartment than your two putters. Yeah, yeah. Use the top just for extra storage and stuff like that. A lot of times when I'm just doing a casual round and the top one I have may have one or two that I like, like the captain, I'm trying yeah. out the captain or, or, or the saint. I was looking mm-hmm. through my closet and I was like, I haven't thrown the saint in a while. So I grabbed that one to put it in. I put it in the top as my kind of like, um, yeah. I, I won't need it as many, unless I think of it or something like that. Yeah. Like today I would have put an extra disc in the, top compartment for like the island the island hole oh one that you're not at country yeah, club where yeah. it's a essentially it's the same disc as what i have in my bag but it's not the actual right disc that i have you know seasoned into um me i do i have drivers and mids and then my putters but when i put them back in and it's 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 kind of interesting because i don't care what i put them back in in that setup mm-hmm. because I literally, and I'm sure it's the same for you and I'm sure the same for a lot of people, but I know my disc color so well. Yeah. Now I know some people like have all white or like yeah, that, yeah. that can't, but like I can tell what my, my peach bio trespass, I can right. tell as soon as I look at my bag, I can tell which disc it is. I can tell uh, my maverick, uh, yeah. my suspect, you know, I can tell exactly what it is. I feel like I can even do it by feel. Like I can the go feel, behind yeah. my back and yeah. just kind of feel and be like, yep, that's the justice. That's, yeah. So I don't know if we answered your question or not, Josh, but that's yeah. kind of how we do our thing. Um, I would highly suggest, though, that you maybe if you're ready to to go to a different, you know, step up in a bag to maybe pick up something like a commander bag because it will mm-hmm. hold. a. Few, I don't know. I can't remember. How many would you think the BP one holds? Um, yeah. 17 or 18. So Ooh. the commander, might, that's yeah. actually quite a few bags. There might be a couple more well, discs, but um, yeah. Okay. So Anthony right. says, uh, and the commander he's fit like 22. So you can fit a, a couple more in the commander bag. The, Prodigy one says it holds up to 32. the BP one holds up to 32. Or are you talking about the, 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 the one is like a ranger. Okay. Yeah. There's probably not too many bags. You're going to fit a whole lot more than that is a lot. maybe the lights would Maybe yeah. The downside of this great little bag is it doesn't hold a ton of discs. I don't, maybe maybe is he, he has talking the about model the wrong number one? wrong. He's gotta be talking about yeah, because they have a smaller version. The BP three holds seventeen. The BP three holds seventeen. So now I, I'm sure you guys are probably thinking. Uh, I just yeah. want to know what projects are. You pick whatever bag you want to pick. Yeah. Um. I don't. Well, I care, but I. You know, whatever. I'm not telling you, but I, if you want to step up. In the sense of you're wanting to step on your capacity and maybe uh, style yeah. a bag, you know, obviously the commander or the ranger bag will do you right. Um, both excellent bags. I'd be um, curious how many discs he actually carries. Yeah, well, yeah, that's weird. When he says doesn't hold a ton of discs, yeah. I'm thinking se- even 17 is a good amount. I don't know if I've ever played a tournament where I've carried more than yeah. 17 or 18 discs. Not sure about that, Josh. What's going on in the YouTube chatter? Uh, I need to fill a gap in my bag. I need to have a disc I can throw flat and have it go straight and come back left. Looking for a driver. 
What suggestions do you have for him? Flat. Yeah, I need to have a disc I can throw flat go and have right it go straight and, come back, and come back left. Uh, I guess it all depends on arm speed, but my first choice or suggestion would probably be a trespass. Yeah. As a distance driver, it's got ability to turn a little bit, um, but it still has some stability at the end to come back and give you that nice long full flight one flat shot. Let's see, Kyle Reed, it looks like he was on YouTube, maybe not anymore, but he has a question here on the forum. How do I get my town interested in disc golf when nobody has ever heard of it? I need inter interest in order to get the town to back the construction of a course. Wow. I mean, this this type of question comes up a lot, and I mean, there's so many intricacies. Ugh. <sighs> Go put a basket out in the park and just throw around and hope that people kind of take notice or ask questions or. Yeah. Uh, I guess I was if thinking. Nobody's even, ever really heard of it. You can only right. sort of put it out there for people to see it. And I mean, if you say you say nobody, do you mean like the like nobody in the town or do you have like a group of disc golfers that play but travel to other places but maybe the maybe like town officials don't know about it right. or something yeah uh i mean my thinking is if you don't have a course locally and there's a park that you won't interfere with other stuff going on you could set up you know a few temporary baskets and hold a somehow organized through the chamber of commerce a disc golf instructional and have people come yeah. play on a few of the baskets um if you've got enough room and you've got enough people that have temporary baskets, set up a nine hole course yeah. and do a, a mini uh, yeah. and get that started every every week. Have a mini a night and then go back to the town and say, look, we have 20 people show up. Mm -hmm. um, what can I do to help build this to where this can become a permanent course? Yeah. You know, yeah, I can, absolutely. You know, I think of that. That might be a route to go. Um, so I don't know if that helps you, Kyle, but hopefully it did. Um, there's a question about the EMAC true, so we'll save that for Mr. EMAC. Caleb wants to know, I want to get some shoes for disc golf, but I'm not sure which ones to get. I know <laughs> you meant to say, I need them to be waterproof and not fall apart. So that is uh, every week I see that new question on all kinds of Facebook groups yeah. and at different places. And so what has been your experience with, with the type of shoes? What shoes do you like to play in? Man, this is so hard um, because I, f I feel like the preference nowadays tends to be in kind of the trail running type shoes because um, they're a little bit lighter, but they're still supportive and sort of meant to be a little bit more sort of rugged and aggressive. Um, and generally they come in waterproof options uh, as well. Um I tend to prefer just to play in running shoes because I prefer just the comfort um, since you are out there walking for 18, 36 or more holes in a day. Um, but ultimately it comes down to, you know, what's your end use? If it's shoes that you want to use for more than just playing disc golf or if you're a toe dragger or something. If you're a toe dragger, Keens are great because they have a big reinforced toe that seems to hold up um, pretty well to that. Um, otherwise it's, uh, you're going to get so many varied yeah. answers, Caleb, that you're just going to have to get out there and experiment. I know you're trying to, you're trying to narrow down yeah. the trial and error for you. So I to I totally get that. I totally get that, but you're going to get so many different answers. There's going to be a few brands that uh, will stick out, you know, the Merrill's, the Solomon's and the Keens and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you'll get some, yeah. some similarities, but then you're going to have some people like him where he says, you know, I just, I get a good pair of Nike trail shoes or I get a good pair of right Reebok trail running shoes or something like that. Um, you, what well, you got to understand, because, you know, you say something that won't fall apart. The thing is, is that concrete versus shoes is not good. You play on concrete tee pads and it's going to tear your shoes up. That's yeah. just the way it is. Um, some people that uh, I, I talked to some people who they remember playing uh, football in, in high school. Um, I played a little bit, but not enough to to have this answer. But um, they go through shoes all the time. 
Oh yeah. Because you're constantly doing. So if you're, if you're the guy who plays around every day or every weekend, you're out there wearing the, you're going to tear those shoes up. So you just got to know that uh, depending on the tee pads you use and how often you play, yep. you're going to tear those shoes up. So you're just going to have to find some, some balance between high quality and, and price point for you that works. Yeah. And any of the major brands that you mentioned are all going to be primarily the same in terms of normal durability. It just, yeah, it comes down to how hard you are on shoes and how much you want to Have you thrown spend. the, have you thrown the war horse yet? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Someone wants to know, have you thrown it? And yeah. is the, is it, is there a pretty big dome on it or is it flat? Uh, the ones that I've thrown have quite a bit of dome to them. Um, probably I would compare it to the dome on an enforcer. Okay. Um, in terms of feel, maybe the rim shapes a little bit different, uh, than an enforcer, but, um, that'd probably be my closest, uh, comparison in terms of, uh, feel in the dome. Gotcha. The horse. Gotcha. All right. Well, we're hitting about the 45 minute mark. I think it is. So we're probably just going to wrap it up. Just, get, uh, see if there's any other questions here on the YouTube channel. So your plans are you've got some stuff to take care of for work after yep. this here yep. in Emporia, and then you're coming back for GBO. Yep. When are you, when did you say you're going to be able to come back? Uh, Saturday. So in so like you'll have the full days. week to practice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How do you? What's typically your practice routine? Uh, I mean, right now it's just to throw as many shots as I can because we've had two feet of snow on the ground for the last <laughs> five months. Um, so right now it's just a, a matter of getting out and throwing and get timing and all that stuff um, back and dialed in. And then next next week when we come back, I'll mm -hmm. kind of take a little bit more um, of a specific approach to certain holes uh, that I want to kind of get dialed in and, and practice a bit more. Very cool. Someone wants to know what your go-to forehand, your go-to straight forehand driver is straight forehand driver uh distance wise is still a trust pass for me backhand and forehand i throw pretty much the same disc to do the same shot just the other direction so i i feel comfortable i know a lot of people generally take more overstable stuff with the forehand because they you get the little bit extra torque and a lot of people will turn it um over a little bit more i actually th try to throw mine on a bit of a hyzer, like I'd be throwing a backhand. Yeah. Um, and so I generally use the same disc forehand and backhand just to go to finish the opposite direction. Gotcha. Tobias has a question for me. Are you coming to Sweden in the Sheleftia Open this year? I absolutely am coming down there. Oh, lucky um, you. I know I get to go to, uh, it'll be my third time back to Sweden, but my first time, uh, because the first uh, first time going to Finland, because our first oh, stop okay. is going to be the Tuni Open that Juha is is got going on there, and he's built an incredible tournament. Um, so yeah, me, Jeremy, and Eric, yeah, Eric is going are going out there. Uh, we're going to go to the Tuni Open, have a good time out there, meeting people, and then we'll head over to Sweden to visit the the Latitude sixty four factory and to uh, have some fun out at the Celestia Open. So yeah, it's going to be a really good time. Well, Zach, thanks. For coming in, uh, we're going to take a little break uh, from this portion, and then we're going to do audio recording. So we won't be back live, uh, but we'll do an audio recording of more of our player interview where we're going to get to know even a little bit more about you, Zach Newhouse. Perfect. And uh, so uh, make sure you are subscribed to the Disc Golf Answer Man show. You can subscribe to a lot of places. In fact, I'm going to bring it up because people ask me, where can I go? How come I can't listen to it at work? Where is it this and that? You can listen to it if you want to on the website. That's a choice. However, I don't always post everything to the website. What's my reason behind that? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I know this sounds, I hope this probably sounds like a cop out, but the weeks that we have like a lot of stuff being pumped out, I just, I edit it, I will we'll record it edit it, produce it, push it out, put it to our libsyn.com and boom, I move on to the next project. Yeah. You know, with the website, I have to find a picture. I have to, you know, there, and when I say it out loud, it sounds kind of tacky. <laughs> it sounds tacky. It's so but, much work about uh, it. Yeah, it's so much work. But, you know, I you can listen to this on iTunes. You can listen to it on Spotify. You can listen to it on Stitcher. You can listen to it on iHeartRadio, Google Play, TuneIn, Overcast, CastBox, Acast, Auto Radio, 
or just download a, a podcast app on your phone and then just subscribe to it and you automatically get every audio thing I, I put out there. Sounds pretty fantastic. <laughs> In fact, one guy even said, uh, can you make your website the ability to when I listen to it and then if I have to go away and I come back and it starts back where I finished – it does that on every other platform except the website. So my thinking mm -hmm. is I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten platforms yes. you can go to, maybe select one of those. And I believe each one of those has the ability to kind of pick up where you left off. Man, I sound like I'm griping, huh? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, guys, so take a listen. We'll have the uh the uh, the player interview on that. Uh, will DD be in Utah this year? I don't know of any plans going to Utah. When will we get more soft justices soon? Any team member, <laughs> I don't know when, <laughs> but any team members plan on playing the King of the Lake tourney in Lake Tahoe this summer? I haven't heard of any, but that doesn't mean, you know, with 70 some, 70 some odd players are, I don't know exactly where everybody's going to be, but I haven't heard of anybody going to go play it. So, all right, that'll wrap it up here in uh, Disc Golf Answer Man Dynamic Disc Studios.